Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for be being here today. My name is Julie, and I will be hosting today's travelogue uh, brought to you by the Geographic Society of Chicago. Since 1898, the Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technology. Through services such as our community mapping projects, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide educational opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials collections in educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies in problem solving, and much more. If you're familiar with our travelogue series, you know that we normally conduct uh, these presentations in person at the Chicago Cultural Center. Since we can't get together physically, the GSC wanted to remain connected with its members and supporters, um, and thus we've turned our travelogue series into webinars. Um, though we've been doing this for about a year, uh, please know that any feedback you have is very welcome. With us to present today is Linda Maynard and Judy Bach. Uh, Linda Maynard is a former middle school teacher where she and Judy taught and formed a friendship. She's a former GSC board member. Linda, Linda has presented uh, various travelogues for the GSC in the past um, of her many travels throughout the US and Europe. She was fortunate enough to have traveled to the Galapagos in 2004 with Judy. It was remarkable for her to get to relive a fantastic experience with a great friend. Judy Bach is a former middle school teacher where she met Linda. After retiring from middle school teaching, she continues to work for Elmhurst University as an instructor and as director of online geospatial programs for the De Department of Geography and GIS. Judy currently serves on the GSC Board of Directors. She is an independent geography and GIS education consultant. She loves to travel and then share her insights and experiences with others. Judy was excited to have the opportunity to return to the Galapagos with her friend Linda. Before we begin, let me note that we will have a question and answer period following Linda and Judy's presentation. If you look at your screen, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, and if uh, at any time during the presentation you have a question for them, go ahead and type it in that uh, Q&A window. Uh, and following the presentation, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. With that, I will pass things over to Linda and Judy for today's presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome, I'm Linda. And um, I'm Judy, and we're really pleased to be here to share our experiences in the Enchanted Isles. We're so glad, and we know that many of you are returning um, viewers to our Travelock series. And um, for those who are new, we welcome you. And we wanna give a special shout out to Ronald O'Neill Elementary School in Elgin. Mrs. Smith's fourth grade class Yay. is watching us. And, and so we're so pleased to have students with us today. We wanna share um, our trip to the Galapagos, which occurred in late August and early September of this past summer. We traveled with National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions. Um, and it wasn't a pleasure cruise. It was really an expedition where you kind of get up close and personal with wildlife and, um, and the landscape. So one thing we wanna do is share information about the conservation efforts that are going on, the environmental ethic that's held in the Galapagos Islands, um, as well as our photographs and experiences with the geology, landscape, animals, and plants that we saw on the trip. Let me give you just a little brief background um, about the Galapagos. Um, it is four, 14 large islands, seven smaller islands, and over 100 rocks and islets. It's 600 miles to the west of Guayaquil, Ecuador, um, off the South American coast. And the official name is Archipelago de Colon. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a Galapagos Marine Reserve, which was just expanded on November 1st in cooperation with Costa Rica, an additional 14 million acres. And that was in response to um, threatened species that are um, endangered and um, some fishing that happened to be pretty nearby. 97% um, of the islands belong to the Ecuador National Park, which was established in 1959. And um, overseeing and working with the National Park is the Charles Darwin Foundation, and you'll hear me referring to them um, pretty often. 
So um, very early on, 1510, so right after, <laughs> I shouldn't say right after, but shortly after we think about uh, 1492 in Columbus, um, an Inca king saw the islands um, when he was just traveling along um, the coastline, but it wasn't officially discovered or named until 1535 by the Bishop of Panama, Fray Tomas de Berlanger. He did stop on the islands and he said, these are worthless. Not much grass, mostly thistles, couldn't find any fresh water. And he kind of referred to them just sort of as the Galapagos, which really mean, in Spanish really means saddleback tortoises. So all through the 1500s and into the 1600s, there were pirates who were looking for the Inca gold on ships, um, uh, buccaneers, whalers. So a lot of people who were in the area and a few who had actually stopped. Ambrose uh, Cowley, was the first person to, known to have mapped the islands. Um, he was an Englishman and he mapped them in 1684. And so he gave all of the islands English names. Um, the islands uh, belong, belong to Spain and Ecuador claimed them in 1832 and renamed them the Archipelago de Colón in honor of Columbus. And um, many of the islands now have a second a Spanish name, which actually to me is uh, they're more common than in the past. So here we are arriving in um, uh, the Galapagos on Baltra. Baltra is a very tiny island. It's eight square miles. Um, it's also known as South Seymour. Um, today, the only people who live in it is a small, um, group of Ecuadorian Navy and Air Force personnel. So there's no permanent city population that lives there. Yeah, so um, from a distance, you can see Baltra is kind of flat. It's a, a raised piece, uh, an uplifted piece of the uh, ocean floor. And so on the top, it was very flat. Um, there was very little interest in this island um, until the 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt um, wanted to have a presence, a U.S. presence, um, nearby the, Pan the western side of the Panama Canal. And he asked the Ecuadorian government if he could establish a U.S. Army base on this island. Um, it's flat, it's near the center of the archipelago, um, and it would be, you know, a good distance um, for watching over <laughs> our, um, our interests in, the, in, the Pan in Panama. Um, the permission was granted, and in 1942, construction began. There were over 200 buildings built on this island for um, the US military. And so there were hangars and barracks, there were offices, um, and there were recreational facilities for the, the men. After World War II, the base went, uh, was returned back to the Ecuadorian government and as part of their Ecuador, Ecuadorian uh, military base. Um, the Ecuadorian government at that time offered each head of household in the Galapagos Islands, the opportunity to come and deconstruct one of the buildings from the, the US military and to bring the building materials back to their own island and, um, and build their own homes. And that's exactly what happened. So here we are at the airport. Linda and I were there in 2004 um, and we saw improvements. Um, notice the, the, the wind turbines on the one side and um, a pretty well-built um, airport tower. Uh, you can see that Baltra is pretty arid, not much growing there. Um, the whole, the facility, that's fine. Okay. They, oh, yeah, the facilities <laughs> were done. Um, we now had a covered walkway to take us um, from our plane into the airport terminal and there's solar panels on top of this. So they're striving to have um, Baltra be um, carbon free or carbon emissions free. Inside, we also saw a lot of changes. Um, when we were first there in 2004, it literally was an open air hut. And outside, outside there were some kiosks um, that people were selling, you know, little tchotchkes and, you know, little souvenir, souvenirs to take home. Today, um, it still is open air, but um, with a much more modern construction, very nice, comfortable seating. There's immigration services. There was a nice bathroom. Um, and they have indoor gift shops now. What I found kind of interesting on the right, you see this table full of food, but there's no in-flight service between um, from the flight from the mainland over to Baltra. And so we were invited to take a lunch with us if we wanted one on our way back home. 
After we left the airport, it was a short shuttle ride uh, to a little pier, and there was our uh, ship waiting for us, a National Geographic Islander, and it's a Lindblad um, ship. And while the um, National Geographic guides and uh, people from one person from the ship guided us, uh, the crew took care of all of our luggage and got that over to the ship. So after we had gone to the ship and seen where our rooms were, our luggage was delivered and that all important if you've done a cruise, that all important safety uh, uh, practice where you have to put your life jacket on and report to wherever it is you're going to jump ship from. <laughs> uh, we went on a cruise uh, in the Zodiacs. And this is just on the next neighboring island. Uh, the island's name is Santa Cruz. We'll talk more about that too. And uh, this is Black Turtle Cove. What you see in the front after the, after the ocean, <laughs> those are mangroves and they are green all the time. They are very salt tolerant um, plants. But beyond that, you see some brown and you see some gray. Those are dormant plants. It was the becoming the end of their winter. Um, although temperature doesn't change a whole lot, it is a lot wetter uh, in our winter months. So that all greens up um, during the rainy season. And then you see uh, two bumps there. Those are parasitic volcanoes, parasitic cones. Um, and they are there to uh, kind of let some of the steam and pressure off if it happens to build up there. So in our little cruise around the cove, uh, we saw this brown pelican and he's sitting atop mangroves. Oh, I was going to say, he is also related to frigate birds, which are very common in the Galapagos, but they think uh, <clears throat> the, the pelican's big um, pouch on his, in his bill was um, evolved because it helped keep uh, his food safe from the other um, frigate birds. Okay, the mangroves, I, like I said, they are very uh, tolerant of the salt. You can see that they have legs or roots or whatever down into the salt water. There are three different kinds. There's black, there's red, and there's white. Um, some I could tell apart, but I, I, I can't from here, but they do um, uh, get rid of the salt before it gets to the major part of the plant or so that the plant can use the fresh water. And one, as it goes up through the plant, there's filters and those filters get rid of the salt. Another version has holes in the bottoms of the leaves, which let the salt escape. So whatever means they are there um, and they're green all the time. This is um, a Pacific green sea turtle. We saw them here, several of them, and we saw them in, in a couple of other places. They're just kind of roaming around and just taking their time and enjoying themselves. This is a black tipped shark maybe 18 inches, maybe two feet long. Uh, there are white tip sharks, similar, and there are other sharks, but luckily we didn't see any of them. <laughs> also atop the mangroves is a, a, a great blue heron, just like the ones we have here. Uh, the birds in the bottom corner are egrets, some more egrets. They're getting ready to settle in for the evening. Egrets are uh, of three kinds, common, snowy, and cattle. And these are cattle egrets. Well, the next morning, um, we were off to explore some more of the islands. We went in the morning to North Seymour Island and in the afternoon to Rabida. So in the morning, we had a hike on this small island of Seymour. It's less, it's just slightly more than one square mile. And it's only 92 feet above sea level. So North Seymour and South Seymour, South Seymour also being called Bul Bultra, um, are 
raised plateaus from the ocean bed. So they're relatively flat. There's no human population that lives here. And they were named after Lord Hugh Seymour. Um, and to my knowledge, I've never received a, um, a Spanish name. So you can see the terrain. These were our typical trails. Um, as we said, it was an expedition and uh, they want you to have the experience of feeling close to the, the environment, no matter what that is. So um, there were times, not only did we have to walk around the rocks, we had to walk around some of the animals at times as well. Um, anything that might've been on this, the path that you see. Um, a lot of, even for such a small island, um, North Seymour has had um, some conservation issues. Um, it's actually been used to help study how, uh, the issues and to study eradication policies. So Baltra, when they built the US airport there, they noticed the land iguanas were not doing well, they were unhealthy. So they moved 70 of them. So in the 1930s, they moved 70 land iguanas to North Seymour. North Seymour did not have an iguana population on it, a land iguana population. And, uh, but they figured the land and the terrain were very similar. So they thought it, you know, that that would be fine. Well, it was a good idea. It was a good thing they did that because by 1954, the land iguanas and Baltra were extinct. Um, their habitat had been ruined um, so much by uh, goats and by building the, um, the airstrip and all of that, that they no longer had what they needed to survive. Um, with that, the Charles Darwin Foundation um, took some of the land iguanas uh, back to their station and to their, you know, they have um, labs and areas that they raise the young and kind of make sure that the um, populations um, stay, are healthy. And in the 1990s, um, they returned 95 land iguanas to Baltra. Um, and today I'm happy to say that in Baltra, they're living and thriving and doing very well. They were also doing very well on North Seymour where they were not originally <laughs> um, located. There's over 2,500 land iguanas recorded on this um, small, small island. The other thing that um, North Seymour is known for is the rat eradication project. Uh, from the time of the buccaneers and the whalers and the pirates, uh, black rats and Norway rats were introduced into the islands. And um, they have a way of decimating and taking over um, the rest of the populations there because they have no natural predators. Plus uh, the rats can swim. So even if you can get rid of them on one island, they, if the islands are close enough, it can actually swim to another island. So in 2007, there was a project that was started by the National Park Service uh, to help eradicate black rats and Norway rats which were not native to the islands. They did this by spreading a poison. Um, however, they discovered it didn't um, kind of disseminate as, or you know, you get um, lose its power as quickly as they thought. And um, there was a lot of residual poison that was left on the land. So even though it was eradicating the rats, um, the natural populations of the Galapagos were endangered. So um, they've came up, um, the poison finally did uh, you know, lose its power. And what they have now instead are little boxes. And you might think about these if you have mouse traps in your house, <laughs> they're little boxes. The um, poison that's in there is um, only the rats go in after it. So no land iguana is going to walk in there. No bird is going to walk in there. Only rats are attracted to this poison. And they get inside that little box and they cannot get back out. And they're, therefore, um, no other species can eat that rat and get the poison into their systems and therefore into the environment. Um, so this policy has um, been going on for um, since 2007 to try to get the rats off the island. Um, we then had a lovely walk. Um, big thing on these islands are the birds. So my favorite, the blue-footed booby. Um, there are two other kinds of boobies. The red-footed booby only uh, is on um, Genesevesa, which is the furthest north um, eastern island, and um, because the red-footed boobies prefer to be remote. And um, then the masked booby, and um, they don't have red feet or blue feet. They're just kind of there. <laughs> But this is a male and the female and male both take turns. They sit on the eggs and they take care of the babies. 
you can see how <laughs> how fancy their nest is. It's just a, a divot in the ground. This is a baby, not as tiny, obviously, as the one that's in the nest. Uh, this one is, in fact, starting to get some of its adult feathers right on its wings, and the blue has not developed. And this is a uh, female. We were told when we're walking that we have to stay about six feet away from any animal. But if you were seated and they chose to be friendly, they could be friendly. So here we go. And she is um, a female and when she gets closer to me in the camera, you can see that she has, her pupils are larger than the male. These were just pinpoints. His or hers are bigger. This is the magic of the Galapagos You can see she's got little claws on the end of her toes. <laughs> yeah, how big her eye pupils are. Other than that, I think they look exactly alike. And now you can see she is a female. Look at her eye. Now that you're very close, her pupil is large. And look at the pupil in the male. Stay where you are, please. Stay. So um, the blue in their feet is a collagen that reflects light. And the better the diet, the bluer the feet. So a female looks for a male who has very blue feet because that would show her that he's a great provider. Here's another shot of a nest. Again, this one looks like it's right in the middle of the trail and um, a fairly large booby, but still not, uh, not a mature one. And you can see the white, so as the parents are taking care of the babies, they're facing inward so that they defecate um, to the outside and around a lot of them, it's, it's totally white and that marks where their nests are. These are the frigate birds. Uh, there's the greater and the magnificent. Here on this island, we could see both. Uh, the greater frigate birds like to fly further out and um, hunt that way uh, in, you know, they get in, they get their food from the ocean. Uh, they can't die for their food like a booby or uh, some other animal, uh, other birds can because they don't have enough oil in their, uh, on their feathers and um, they couldn't survive that. So they can grab it off the surface or what they like to do is uh, steal mid, mid flight. They like to steal those. So these are male frigates. Um, you can see what they both have the red bladder in, on their neck, but you can see the one is uh, ballooned out. The other one isn't. So this is a um, mating ritual that the males do. And not only do they puff out, but they then make, um, you know, some little dancing moves and, um, and some vocalizations. Also, you can see that they are up in um, the trees. They nest up because they can't take off from the ground. They either have to take off from a tree like this or from um, you know, a cliff and be able to get going that way. Here's a closer shot of that male or a male. I don't know if it was the same one, uh, but you can see again, his bladder is all blown up. And those little black spots there on it are just more feathers. These are babies. Again, they're up in, um, in the trees and um, they just are waiting for food. This is a female. She has um, obviously no red uh, pouch, uh, but she has white. And this is a great frigate because she has so much white on her and the magnificent female would only have just a little around her neck. Here's one of those famous iguanas. 
<laughs> that came from Valtra and is a descendant from all of those. So in the afternoon, we sailed over to Rabida. Uh, Rabida, again, very small island. It's um, a little bit less than two square miles. Um, it was originally named Jervis Island after the British Admiral John Jervis. And the Ecuadorian name, Isla Rabida, comes from um, sort of an homage to, to Columbus. It was the name of the convent in Spain where he left his sons when he traveled to the Americas. Uh, when you're, yes, coming up to Rabida, we, you know, again, you know, you're kind of looking at it. It's, um, it's kind of a little bit dumb shaped. There's actually two pyroclastic cones here. And you can see that it's kind of grayish and, you know, the coastline is kind of jagged. Um, however, it is one of the most volcanically diverse islands that you find in um, the Galapagos. Because when you come around to the northern edge, you get a beautiful red beach. Now this red changed colors depending on the time of day. So at times it looked orange and depending on whether it was wet or not. But um, this is due to the iron oxide that were, was in the minerals that were brought up by the pyroclastic cones that were on this island. Um, there's a saltwater lagoon behind these um, green bushes that you see here. Um, and again, there were a lot of challenges on this island um, for conservation. In the 1970s, goats were put here partly because of these bushes and other bushes. They're green, even in winter. And um, so it was food for the goats, um, which people were keeping um, for meat and for milk. And actually they were put here by some of the, you know, the, in the 16, 16, 17, 1800s, people brought them over as a food source. Um, they did eradicate the goats, <clears throat> excuse me, by the end of 1970, in the 1970s, and it is goat free now. But in the process of doing that, um, the goats literally almost wiped out an entire plant species called the shrub snapdragon. We didn't actually see it on the island. Um, it was first discovered right before the goats were introduced. Um, and then after the goats left, it was, um, there was plenty there even during a drought or the dry season. But by 2007, there were only five, I'm sorry, four plants left on the island that could be discovered. So again, the Charles Darwin Foundation came in, um, collected seeds, brought them back to their laboratories, raised small plants and seedlings and did that over and over again until they had enough that they could bring multiple plants back to Rabida. And in 2020, they repatriated these seedlings um, to the island, to this particular island, so that um, it, they could reestablish this natural environment. Okay, so we spent part of the afternoon on this island um, on the beach um, practicing our snorkeling so that we, when we went the next couple of days, we, we were comfortable. They brought us back later in the evening. Again, um, the National Geographic Limblad people were just so good about planning our excursions, our online excursions when the light was good for photography. We were out in the morning, we were out in the evening, and this was spectacular because the sun just about set before we got back to the ship. And uh, a red beach and a red sunset, you can't beat that. So this was one of the first little things we saw. Um, looking down the beach, we could see this huge beach with all these little round balls, tiny little balls, all, all down the beach. Well, this little white uh, crab, a ghost crab, is what is responsible for that. And you can see the uh, um, sand around the crab is kind of disturbed and it's looking for food. It's going through it with its little pinchers and, and you know, little, little crab things. <laughs> And um, in doing that, it forms those little round balls. And I don't know why, but it's just kind of amazing. This is a, an American oyster catcher. And I did happen to see these um, in the United States when I was visiting Virginia and the Chincoteague, Assateague area. So, um, and, and they were actually eating oysters when I saw them. We were lucky enough 
to see flamingos arriving and they were headed to that uh, saltwater lagoon that's just on the other side. So here we have them. Uh, they are very, very pink because of their diet. Their diet uh, consists of um, brine shrimp and other little crustaceans that they can muck up from the bottoms of these lagoons. Their beaks shovel upside down to, um, and then filter uh, the gunk out and leave the food behind so that they can eat them. And that's the cause for the pink, the pink feathers, the pink legs. They do have flight feathers that are black and you can see just a little rim here, but when they fly, you can see them better. Um, flamingos often stand on one leg as you can see one here and, and one back here must be on one leg too because um, they don't have three legged <laughs> or one legged flamingos. Uh, they stand on one leg to either preserve the heat because the water in the Galapagos is cold, about 70 degrees uh, it, when we were there, and or to um, ease their stress on their hearts. I keep saying I don't understand why a flamingo would have any stress in the Galapagos, but they live in colonies and uh, they tend to mate for life. They share the parental duties of uh, sitting and feeding. And one of the strangest things I ever heard is that they both, male and female, produce milk from their um, um, digestive tract that, that feeds the babies for the first two months until those babies' bills are strong enough to start hunting through the muck for their own food. So it's uh, the milk that they produce is um, high in fat. So that helps them survive, the babies survive. Oh, these are the Palo Santo bushes or trees actually that we saw along the beach. And I thought these were kind of interesting because there was very little greenery to this point that we had seen. So I was asking the naturalist about them. Well, first of all, Palo Santo means holy wood. And then it started to make sense. Most of the, the Spanish population and the Ecuadorian population um, are a Catholic and within their religious ceremonies, they would burn incense. And the Palo um, Santo tree has a very fragrant incense. So it helps supply um, supplies to the religious services. But in addition to that, the wood, the resins and the oils are also very therapeutic, um, especially like for arthritis. Plus, they learned that it repels mosquitoes and flies. So it's a very useful tree. Uh, the next wonderful thing we, that we were able to um, interact with on Rabida are the sea lions. They're females. Um, uh, they, the, the males have a harem. So on each beach, usually, unless it's a pretty huge beach, on each beach, there is one male and then all those females and their babies belong to him. And if another male comes around, um, it can get pretty nasty. Uh, these gals um, tended to be pregnant. And if you can see the one on the right, she tends to have quite a belly. Uh, and I don't think it was just because she ate a big dinner. <laughs> And here I talked about the, the sun, um, the angle of the sun and the red and the beach. And it was just absolutely gorgeous. So overnight, we um, traveled north of the equator, came up around um, Isabella and came back to the equator on the west side of the island. So Isabella is the largest island. You can see it kind of looks like a seahorse. Um, it's larger than all of the other Galapagos Islands put together. And it has a high altitude, They're about 56,000 feet on one of the volcanoes. You can see five volcanoes, the brown spots there, and right at the tip of the nose, uh, the Ecuador volcano used to be there, but it collapsed. So this was um, Isabella's, um, is a series of coalesced volcanoes that the lava finally um, joined together. Originally it was called the Albemarle 
um, island for the Duke of Albemarle, but renamed Isabella in honor of the queen, um, the person who, the queen that was in charge when Columbus came to the new world. It's one of the younger islands. Um, the, the volcanoes are still active. The last one that I could find that actually erupted was in about 2012, and um, it lasted for two months. So when we talk about volcanic eruptions, um, it's, not, it's usually an episode of a series of things that get shot out of the earth or ooze out of the earth. Um, so that was quite an episode on this particular one. There are people living on this island, there's about 1800 people that live on the southern end of the island. Um, they've established some cities there. They had ranches. There was a, a limestone production factory using the corals off of the island, sulfur mines, um, and coffee plantations. Well, when people came and started to live here, again, of course, we had our goats. <laughs> they now brought pigs. They brought donkeys as sort of a, a pack animal, especially in the mines. And as people, if people were not successful, when they left, they usually just left the animals. Well, this little piece of land here is called an isthmus. And um, they discovered that some of the donkeys and the goats who were left free to roam around, especially if their owners um, left the island, um, started to migrate and travel into the other parts of northern part of Isabella, because again, they had good food source there and no competition for it. Well, I remember when Linda and I were there in 2004, um, I couldn't understand. They said, you cannot go to Isabella. We're not going to Isabella. And it was sort of like, why not? It's the biggest island. It has all this vegetation and all these wonderful species on it. Um, and they just said, oh, they're doing some conservation work there. Well, little did I know when I went, when we went back this time and we could go to it, they, that's the conservation work that they were doing. They were eradicating uh, donkeys and goats in this Northern part of Isabella. And so today, um, the things that are left here are mostly native species. The goats and the donkeys are, have both been eradicated um, from it. Ready? Yep. So uh, we did cross the equator actually twice, once during the night when we were all asleep, and then again the next morning right after breakfast. So they had a little ceremony, um, you know, a countdown, um, there was, however, no line that we could see as we sailed across the, the equator, <laughs> but they did have the ceremony, and this is uh, us just after the ceremony. Behind us, you can see the collapsed volcano Ecuador. Um, you know, you have that big low spot that's there. And so because we're talking about volcanoes, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, the geology of this area. We can go ahead. First of all, there's three kinds of volcanoes. If you recall from your, your school, from your classes in science, um, one is called a composite volcano or stratovolcano. And so when you think of Mount St. Helens, Mount McKinley, Mount Hood, those are all composite volcanoes. They, they're very tall. They're usually over a thousand feet tall. Um, they, they, they're cone shaped. And often we get these big explosive eruptions of lava and pyroclastics into the air. Well, a second kind of volcano, which is the type that's actually in the Galapagos, are called shield volcanoes. These are the same type that we find in Hawaii. Um, these occur in the center of a plate. So we have our, uh, there, the Galapagos is on the Nazca plate, which is moving very slowly or quickly by some people, two inches per year towards the South American coast. So they're moving east, southeast, two inches per year. Well, as they move, um, there's a hot spot or sort of a break in um, the, where the magma meets um, Earth's crust. And if it, because there's pressure under the Earth, um, if it finds a crack, it's going to come up through that crack and um, it's going to kind of just ooze out on the surface. These are not hugely explosive, although sometimes there are lava fountains. We do see thing and ash that gets um, shot up into the air but they're not like Mount St. Helens kind of explosive. Um, everything here just kind of oozes out onto the surface. And over time, these volcanoes build up and build up and they tend to be um, more dome shaped. They're flatter and they're very, very broad. And that's why for Isabella, we saw that there were multiple volcanoes that just kind of coalesced. They just, you know, the lava finally just went together. Well, there's different colors of lava too. Sometimes 
um, we think about lava as always being dark. Well, it's not. It has to do with the mineral content and a little bit about how it was actually formed. Um, the stuff you see that's tan here um, is referred to as tuff. And um, tough is going to be more ash-like, and then over thousands of years and millions of years, it becomes compressed and becomes a little bit harder rock. But if you look closely, you can see lots and lots of layers. And before, remember I mentioned that the one volcano was exploding for two months? Well, that's what happens. It explodes and the dust gets up into the air and then it floats back down and it creates a layer. And so you can actually just think about tree rings in a tree where you can count how old um, the tree is, with volcanoes, you can trace this geologic history by looking at these different layers, whether it's um, going to be this volcanic ash or whether it's going to be basalt layers that you see up here on the top that, that's a darker rock. The other thing that's kind of interesting, you can find out something about the type of explosions that were going on geologically. So we have lots of tough layers down here, but notice we have a rock or a cinder layer in here. That would have been a little bit more explosive. Um, to have these cinders come out. So you can learn a lot about the geology by starting to look at these rocks. Um, the other thing that happens, remember I said this was on a plate, so it's coming up through a hot spot on the plate. Let me go back one more thing. I said there were three kinds of volcanoes. So we have the uh, composite, we have the, the shield volcano, which I was just showing you some things about. The third type is called a cinder cone. And you do find cinder cones in the Galapagos, they tend to be more in the eastern islands. Cinder cones only get to be about 100 feet high, and they literally shoot out cinders or small pieces of rock. And they're a little bit more cone shaped, they're just not very high. Okay, so if you have this, think of a flat piece of paper and you push on each edge, it's going to crumple in the middle. Well, basalt rock is considered somewhat um, rigid and it fractures, so you, get lot, you can get lots of cracks in it. Or also, if you think about making a cake and when it cools, sometimes you get a crack on the top of it. Well, that's what happens when lava cools. It gets cracks in it. So when you get the pressure of this plate moving to another plate and it kind of crashes into it, something has to give. Either the plate has to go under the other plate or it has to come up. And in this case, this isn't the edge of a plate, but just along the fissure lines or through those little you know, cracks, it pushes the earth up. And this is called uplift. So you, again, you can see all the layers, tough layers and different kinds of volcanism that happened, but then you can tell that there was something that caused this to be pushed up to come on a slant. And I love this photo as well, um, because it not only shows, I love the, you know, the iron oxide in there really shows so beautifully and, you, you know, so a different kind of, you know, mi minerals being brought up from Earth's center, um, the basalts, but it shows another part of the geologic processes and that's weathering. So in this case, we have rockfall and rockfall is the, or weathering is the break down, breaking down of um, any mountain systems that start to get built up. So it might've had a little cave here, this got too heavy on the top and it came crashing down. Um, lots of different ways that weathering can occur. But, you know, so this takes us, not only do we see the lava and the uplift, but we also see the weathering. And finally, um, it's not often you can see the inside of a volcano. Um, so this is part of that collapsed volcano. And think about um, a, a tree again, and you have the main trunk. And that's what happens in a volcano. You have a main conduit that brings the magma up from the center of the earth, or not quite the center, but um, brings it up to the earth's surface. And, um, and then it, it flows out onto the surface, but just like a tree, it has branches that go off of it. And we call these pipes or conduits. And so in this photo, it's really obvious to see a separate little pipe. And these would form parasitic cones, just like Linda pointed out on um, the island of Santa Cruz in one of the first slides. And um, so you can see that it weathers a little bit differently. So just wanted to, to give you a little bit of information about Volcanoes. <laughs> now onto some fun. <laughs> so this is a zodiac. This is what we've been referring to. Anytime we left the ship, uh, we were on this. Um, this is uh, before we did any snorkeling or kayaking that day. We took a, a, a zodiac ride, and that's where the pictures we the 
volcanic pictures we took. And this is another wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Lucas, will you have the Soviet drivers, you know, <laughs> taking pictures, mm -hmm. cameras right there, that's because there is something. Not all the time we have this great opportunity to have them. So these guys, most of these guys don't leave them Okay, I don't know if you could understand what uh, our guide was saying, but he was pointing out that uh, the Zodiac driver, who you would think sees, has seen everything a million times, um, was actually taking a picture of the same sea turtle we were taking a picture of. So um, they hadn't been out for a while because of COVID, but they uh, absolutely love what they do. And then we snorkeled, and this is part of what we saw. the boat motor. It's so relaxing to watch these turtles just float effortless, effortlessly, sure. <laughs> what, what also astounded me was all this beautiful reflection of the light on the white sand bottom. It was, it was mesmerizing. There were a lot of little um, shelves and, you know, things. These two flightless cormorants were standing up on one and um, they just look so happy, don't they? They're flightless and you can see in this picture why. Their wings uh, relative to their body size are very short and they don't have very many feathers. So their feathers couldn't, their wings couldn't hold them up. And it was discovered or, or, or that um, they um, are, um, sure, that they didn't have any, um, any enemies. So they didn't have to worry about things and did less and less flying as time went on and their, wings just atrophied. And um, so this is a very good uh, picture of why. And our cute little um, penguin or penguini as they're called. <laughs> and um, so we were so lucky to see these animals. Can I talk about? Yes, uh, so the penguin and the flightless cormorant live just in this particular area of the Galapagos on the Western shores of um, Isabella and a little bit on Fernandino, Fernandina, Adina, sorry. Um, and because they live in such a limited um, region, they're considered indicator species. So if there were any changes in um, their health or uh, the viability of their eggs, um, the National Park Service, working with the Charles, Found Charles Darwin Foundation, could start to assess um, what was causing the changes. Was it something due to humans? Um, is it something due to habitat destruction or changes in habitat? And certainly one thing they're watching very closely is how climate change may be affecting these. Because these birds don't go anywhere else, they just stay in this area, they can look at them and study those features. Um, we also on that day, on part of our Zodiac ride, um, had, were able to see a sea cave so um, this is an area where two of the volcanoes kind of came together and there was the rock was a little bit different. The ocean waves kind of eroded away part of this and we have a sea cave. Which is another type of weathering. Yes. Right? So in the afternoon, we went over to Fernandina. Um, you can see it's the westernmost island. It is the most active. It is currently either totally over or very close to being over. Um, the hot spot that the NAS uh, um, on the Nazca plate. Um, it and Genovesa, which is way over here on the eastern end of um, the Galapagos Islands, are where the red footed boobies live. Yes, <laughs> are the most pristine um, of all the islands because they have never had an introduced species, a mammal species, let me say that, an introduced mammal species. So no goats, donkeys, or pigs, <laughs> cats. Now, there may be some rats. But there also are endemic rice rats on both of these islands. Um, and they were worried that they were endangered, um, and, but they have found um, a few small colonies of, on those rats. 
Um, Fernandina was named in honor of King Fernando of Spain, who again um, sponsored the voyage of Columbus. So that's the name that we know it by. Um, the British name was Narborough Island. Um, the last time this volcano erupted was in 2020. So we have relatively new lava um, that's here. And so it was a great site to look at um, the, the newly formed lava and how you know the coastline changes. You can see it's really very jagged along this. There are thoughts that eventually it may coalesce also with Isabella if it keeps erupting and growing. There's two types of lava. They're both named after the lava in Hawaii. And um, one type is called a'a. Linda likes to call it ouch, ouch. <laughs> and so do other people actually. I've heard that owie, before. Owie, owie. owie yes. Um, what you see, it's chunky. Now lava is often black, but again, depending on the minerals, it's gonna take on a little bit different color. So this has a little bit more brownish color to it. But it, yeah, it's big, clunky, chunky. And I've seen pictures of people in Hawaii Wa literally walking in front of an ah uh -uh lava flow. So it flows very, very slowly. You can actually outwalk it. The other type of lava is known as pahoe hoi. It flows a little bit faster. It's a little bit more viscous. Um, and what happens is as it flows, the, cr the top part crusts up, it gets hard, but the lava is still flowing somewhat underneath it and maybe coming up to it. And so it kind of pushes up on itself. And when it does that, it gets this ropey texture. Most of the lava that we have seen on the islands um, is actually weathered. So the wind and the water kind of take out these textural features. So this was a special time to be able to see that. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting uh, geologically are the different beaches. Um, when you saw Rabidia, with that red sand beach. I don't know if you noticed, it was very fine sand, just like you might have any beach by your house. Um, other beaches, this one on Ferdinandina, <laughs> sorry about that, um, it's a lot more gravelly. It's before it's had the chance to weather even more. So it has a lot of little seashells in it. It has pieces of lava. It has the spines from Sea urchins. sea urchins thing all of a sudden that. <laughs> um, and maybe even bits of coral that sometimes form around the islands. Um, eventually this will wear down, but this is sort of the beach sand um, on this island. So the big um, draw for uh, animal people on this island um, were the marine iguanas. Before we saw one sample of the brown and yellow land iguana. Well, these are marine iguanas. And uh, here you have a more close up view. I think uh, a face only a mother could love. And um, it's believed that both the land iguana and the marine iguana were the same way back and had to figure out how to adapt because there wasn't enough food for all of them. So the marine iguanas develop the ability to go out into the cold water. Um, they can go out now for maybe an hour or so. And because they are uh, cold blooded, just like any other little lizard kind of thing. And um, they develop the ability to then be able to deal with the salt water that they encounter um, because of their swim. You can also see the claws on this iguana and it's got very sharp nails. When they dive down, they dive and they have to scratch the um, algae and the, the um, vegetation off the rocks and things down below. So, um, so they evolved this ability to get their food and survive by using the, the ocean. So here we have some of them coming in on their swim. And I thought it was a bit creepy. <laughs> Watch them pop up out of nowhere. After they come out, uh, like again, this is a deep walk, and it's still plenty hot, but it's deep walk. You have to get out of the water. I'm going to
and get their body temperatures back up to whatever their normal is uh, in order to survive nightfall. So you could see them all kind of aiming for the black uh, of the lava and they actually end up on top of each other. And that is to absorb the warmth from the sun, the rocks and each other. Now, as we were standing there watching them, every once in a while you'd see uh, one of, another of them snorting little bursts of salt water out their noses. And they did that, you know, over and over again to rid their body of the salt water. This is another species that's very popular or very prevalent in the Galapagos. And these are Sally Lightfoot crabs. And you can see some over here on the side that are darker so that when they're small and vulnerable, they're black and, and camouflage with the rocks very well. But as they get bigger and older, they become very bright orange and very bright red. And they even have some, some turquoise on them. And they're just all over the place. In fact, you had a, a meeting with them on a beach, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, listen carefully. <laughs> Okay, that fellow in the back there is the beach master. He is standing guard, watching over his harem. And the lady in the front has just got a brand new pup. Um, so she'll be there for 48 hours or so and just let the baby nurse. And then she has to leave. She has to go out and find some nourishment so that she'll be able to um, continue to make milk and feed the baby um, ongoing. So you heard three sounds, you heard the beach master, the, the other bigger sound was were the females. And then there was one, and I don't know if you could pick it out, but one that was a teeny tiny baby sound and they're just so sweet. <laughs> this again is an, another mom and a very young pup. And you can tell the difference in a sea lion, which these are sea lions, and a seal. And that's the sea lions, as you can see here, can stand up on all four flippers or all four um, appendages, and they can walk. A seal can't. A seal kind of army crawls itself around. It doesn't use its back feet at all, but uh, back flippers at all for feet. There's a difference in their neck lengths and uh, their ears um, and maybe something else. But the uh, most, most obvious thing is that sea lions can walk on their feet. So again, overnight, we kind of stayed in that particular area. We crossed over Bolivar Channel and went back to um, Isabella Island where during the day we went to Urbina Bay and Tatakas Cove. Urbina Bay has um, sort of an interesting geologic history where in, um, in, in, the in 1954, all of a sudden there was an earth movement that caused the beach to raise up 16 feet. So if you think about this, you know, the height of maybe two, a two story house without any kind of pointed roof or anything like that, um, leaving like a whole new beach to be formed. Uh, and again, they could tell this because they had seen some um, sea worms and other skeletal remains that were at a much higher and inland um, right. position way behind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we're running way slower than we should be. Sorry. Uh, this is a land iguana. You can see uh, they're somewhat uh, the color of their surroundings when they're off the path and really in the um, in the um, under the trees and things are much even much harder to see. They spend a lot of time in the burrows. And you can see just real quickly here uh, how their little feet are just for walking. They don't have to, they don't have to um, scratch out their food. Their food is usually where they can reach up and grab it or maybe have to climb a cactus. Uh, 
again, we had to walk around them often. They aren't a bit shy, shy. They just wait, and, you know, don't pay any attention to us at all. The interesting thing is you can always see where uh, land iguana is because it leaves a track with its tail. And it was funny because sometimes you could see, you know, uh, U-turns, other kinds of things. They molt just like other reptiles. Uh, and these guys molt just a little bit at a time. So here you can see the skin um, starting to slough off the um, hindquarters of this particular land iguana. This is very important to the Galapagos. It's the main pollinator. It is a Galapagos carpenter bee. This is the female. She does all the gathering. The male stays back and protects the hive. This is Galapagos cotton. Um, it's uh, kind of important, not because you can make jeans or anything out of it, but the scientists found that they can infuse the cotton fibers with insecticide and the birds use the fibers to line their nests and the insecticide then keeps the birds from um, being um, bothered by a, a nasty um, invasive uh, uh, fly that comes around. This is the uh, blossom. It's the largest blossom uh, of all the species of flowers on the islands. And most of the islands, uh, most of the flowers have yellow because that's what the carpenter bee is attracted to. And I think it's the, I think it's the easiest color. I think that's what they said. Something about the easiest color to make. Another yellow, and this uh, is the um, cordia plant. And just a quick story, this is uh, Patro. He was one of our uh, na na National Geographic uh, guides and so enthusiastic, but he grew up in the Galapagos. And he was telling us that if they couldn't get all their school supplies like school glue, they took these little berries and he took one and showed us. He, rolled it around in his fingers and then he did like this and you could see it get sticky. And so when they needed school glue, they used that. And then he also admitted that they used it for hair gel too. Mm -hmm. and just a quick note about our guides. Um, all of the guides are trained for many years. They have tests they have to take. They become experts in the geology, the history, um, the animals, the plants. Um, and then, um, they can be hired as one of the park rangers for the National Park Service in Ecuador. Um, a change that we had seen in 2004, our guide had already started telling us about some changes that were going to be happening in the park service. Um, he happened to be German by descent, but had married someone from Ecuador and had become an Ecuadorian, but he was not born in the Galapagos. He, and he told us in 2004 that eventually you would have to be born in the Galapagos in order to be a park service guide. No, first. Well, first yes. you have to be Ecuadorian and then hopefully. Born in, yeah, Ecuador. Yeah. No. Um, and um, so we've seen that come to happen. Um, the, the three guides were all born in Ecuador. Pacho happened to be born in the Galapagos. So another change that is actually evolving is that eventually all guides in the Galapagos will have to have been born in the Galapagos. So um, there's this little evolution uh, going on. <laughs> So um, one of my favorites are the giant tortoises. We did not expect to see any giant tortoises at this, our guides didn't anyway, um, at this particular walk. And he, so they were very, very excited that we did. And not only did we see one, we saw seven. Um, the, these, this tortoise is about 20 to 25 years old. They live to be about 150. Um, they've become greatly endangered. There's about 12 species that live on 10 different islands, but some of the species have gone extinct, like Lonesome George, who was from Pinta Island. He was the last of his species. And so some have become extinct over time. And we got to see him in 04. Yes, we did. Um, this tor tortoise is a has a dome-shaped shell. You can see that it's dome-shaped. And it means that um, these tortoises eat things that are closer to the ground, meaning that they're on, um, islands that have a little bit more vegetation, um, have a little bit more rainfall. 
The saddleback tortoise, which Galapagos um, were named after, this part of the shell is like the horn, like think of a, a saddle on a horse that you might be riding on a horse and it kind of flips, it comes up. Um, the saddleback tortoises, this front part of the shell is much higher. And that's, those are gonna be on more arid islands and where the tortoises need to uh, reach up much higher in order to get their food. Um, this, these tortoises um, live near one volcano only. So on Isabella that has five volcanoes, they have five different species and they don't cross over. They, for whatever reason, they don't cross over all the lava. Um, they mate at the rim of the caldera for the volcano. And then the female actually walks 12 miles to the ocean and down about 3,600 feet in this particular case from the El Cito volcano um, in order to plant her eggs. Most of uh, the tortoises we saw um, here were like, like the picture, previous picture, they just stood still, but we were lucky enough to have this encounter in front of us. Seriously? Yeah, they're gonna bite each other. Everybody each other. What are you doing that way? Get out of here. Bumping turtles. It's like bumper turtles. Bumper cars. They bumper cars. It's a standoff. Is it or they're biting? Can't tell right now. Can everybody see? <laughs> we need a drone for this. Mm -hmm. We do. They just don't want to go in there and interrupt what they're doing. Probably one turns around and comes back this way. Yeah, they, they must be a, a loser. So they elevate their heads like that, exactly. The one with the highest head, it's got more chances of winning the battle. One is blocking the way. It's like, you don't go there. It's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's pushing you. Look. Now it's going to full speed ahead and walk this one this way. Don't move. Don't move. I have it coming right up to us. It's, it's the chase of the century. <laughs> and they're racing. We just ended up having a tortoise race. Okay, uh, that went on. They stopped and didn't move for probably another minute and a half. So we're not going to watch them sit there. Um, we ended up walking around them. So nothing really happened, I don't think. Um, small birds. We do have uh, some shots of some. This is a yellow warbler. This isn't all that small, but um, it is certainly all land. Um, and this is the Galapagos hawk, or uh, buteo is what he's called in Spanish. This is the Galapagos mockingbird, much um, physically like our mockingbirds here in the south and um, southeast. Um, he didn't have much of a, of a song because he has nothing to mock. There's no, no real songbirds. And the famous Galapagos or Darwin Finch, the Galapagos Finch, but Darwin Finch. And that's where he noticed that all these finches at the different islands and different places in the islands have different characteristics. And uh, the last of uh, the small birds is a tyrant flycatcher. Uh, this was a bonus wow. for us. So we had a, a brief encounter with those lovely um, dolphins and uh, it went on a bit, but th that was the best shot of them right there. And another venture into a cave with our kayaking expedition. Um, seen a lot of diving birds, couldn't catch them in action, however. <laughs> These uh, are just awesome. The round thing in the corner, a sea star. Who knew? I thought it was some kind of an anemone. And then we have two version or two uh, samples of the Sally Lightfoots. They really, all of them blended in so well. So this is Tagus Cove. Our ship is out in the cove itself. And um, right before you is Darwin Lake. This was, Tagus Cove was one of the places Darwin stopped and came to collect some um, species. Um, the lake was named after him, obviously, um, and it's in a tough cone. So this, there was a high explosion here. It was so close to the ocean that ocean water came into this before it kind of closed off and sealed itself off. 
um, and the caldera part of the tough cone um, fell about 30 feet. And it's hyper saline, meaning that it has about um, 15 to 16% salinity. It's considered one of the most beautiful walks in the world, actually, according to the guidebooks. <laughs> it was way uphill and she was braver than I. And we um, went to Santiago Island. Um, this um, island uh, does not have any human population on it today. And it has a couple different volcanoes that again have coalesced. Darwin stayed here for about two weeks where he, and collected a lot of samples. And it really was the place where he first noted um, that the different islands had different species of tortoises. So in his journaling, he took note of that. And then also noted the large number of land iguanas on Santiago. However, today there are no land iguanas that live there. So again, we've you know, we know that extinction has occurred there. And of course you guessed it due to the goats, due to the pigs, due to the rats and the donkeys because they were eating the vegetation and trampling the habitat. So this has been um, a huge part of Isabella, the Isabella project to rid the islands of invasive species. It is the biggest island on earth where animals have been eradicated. So they have gotten rid of the pigs, the goats and um, the donkeys off of this island. One thing we saw in many places was graffiti written. People like to record where they were. Some of it is being preserved, especially the stuff from the, you know, from the 1800s where it's been etched into the stone. Others like this may eventually be removed by the National Park Service. Right. <laughs> and I mentioned in the beginning that there was over a hundred um, islets and rocks. So before you, you see an example of a rock um, it's something that becomes detached from the mainland. It's a prickly pear cactus growing on it. And on the right-hand side, you see um, what we would call a hoodoo in the United States. It's carved out by wind in particular, and it's named the Praying Bishop. Um, another rock formation, this one's um, at, Igus, um, at Porto Igus, um, it's still attached to the land somewhat by the beach, but eventually it will become a rock of its own just out in the ocean um, through weathering. And you see a nice little arch that's there. Okay, this was uh, the evening <laughs> of our last night. And this was a walk um, and our goal was to um, go to a grotto. Uh, this island had had people living on it. Um, and when their endeavors failed, they just left. And you could see uh, signs of them having been there. This is on the beach itself, and you can see that this had some real sand to this beach. And that's a uh, morning glory that's uh, streaking down the um, beach. This is a striated heron, and this is a striated heron at work. It's an striated heron. Can you imagine? Now that is probably Galapagos. He doesn't even care about uh, our presence. We're all kind of anxious to see what he would get. He's going after you. <laughs> but then we're all he thought. <laughs> and he didn't hunt any longer. This is a prickly pear cactus. It's on many of the islands. Um, it's one of the things that the uh, land iguanas like to eat. And you can see a wasp on the side of it. Um, it's a paper wasp. And it also does help to do pollination. And we have a lava lizard. They're very small, uh, maybe five, six inches long. And they were on various islands and took kind of the color of the, the, what was underneath them. They didn't change colors, but they kind of evolved into the color of the, the, what was predominant. Then we got to the grotto area. Grottos are like a series of little small caves that kind of connect a little bit underwater. So this was along the water's edge, right, you know, with a lava flow that had been kind of etched out. Sorry. So what did that sound like to you? Maybe a toilet bowl? Um, that's what this has been named. So in the grotto, you have these holes that waves wash up and make sounds. Okay, this is a fur seal. 
They are much smaller than the sea lions that we saw. They like to live in a more isolated area. So instead of hanging around in pairs and you know more, they spread themselves out. There weren't that many anyway, but they spread themselves out. You can see the dirty look that I'm getting for even being near there. And just a couple more grotto shots. This was looking out over all that lava. And um, our last stop was going to be at Manzanillo Ranch, which is on Santa Cruz Island. Santa Cruz Island is one island that has been just like totally inhabited and, um, and has so many introduced species, plant and animal, that it will never be returned to being natural. And you can see the Baltra, where we're going to take off on the plane, is right across a small channel. So um, they have one road. It's the only road in all of Galapagos that goes across an entire island. Paved. paved. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, there are other paved roads in some of the cities, but not like, you know, this is the one that's across the island. And once you get off of that paved road, you get into dirt roads. And, you know, these are some of the small little towns and places that people live. Again, it's um, been highly farmed, a lot of agriculture there. Oops, oh, sorry. That's okay. This is also, um, a nature reserve for the tortoise. So they are allowed to roam free. Uh, Manzillo Ranch, because um, we're higher in elevation, you get what's called um, Gararu. I'm, and, and it's a misty rain that rain. you get. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so our bus could not pass this tortoise. We had to wait for him to kind of move off a little bit, um, obviously. So. Oh. And I was just going to say that Manzanillo is it is a destination. Um, they had boots that we could wear out in the in the wet, and probably protect the area from whatever might have been on our shoes. But um, they had a little gift shop, of course. They had bathrooms, and then they had all this expanse that. Um, our guides took us around a bit, and then we were free to wander and watch and look at the giant, the bigger ones, the giant giants uh, in their own habitat. But listen carefully if you can. Not sure if you can hear a sound that sounds like heavy breathing. It's actually part of the hydraulic system of the turtle. It's when they, as they start to move, it's just sort of the movement within them. This guy discovered, like I said, this the tor tortoises can roam free. He's about 150 pounds, and um, they're not quite sure how old I mean, he is, but he certainly is an adult. Um, but, and they provide lots of stuff here for the tortoises to eat, so they stay in the area, but they are free to roam around the reserve as they like. So grapefruits are one of the things that they grow in this area. The other thing, they like to wallow in the little ponds. Um, so only three sounds that they say the tortoises mm -hmm. make. One is that hydraulic sound, which they don't really make on purpose, it just happens as they move their body. The second is um, occasionally they pass gas and we could hear it when they were in the water in particular because it would bubble up. But um, the third is when they mate and evidently they have some very, very loud grunts and groans while they are mating. We did not hear that sound. This is the paved road. It goes from one side of the island to the other and this is headed back toward um, Baltra. First of all, we, you know, we stop and have to get on a little ferry that takes us across the short span. They didn't make us swim. And so when we arrived, we were asked um, not to take anything with us from the islands themselves, um, but, and to only leave our footprints. So, so it was a pleasure traveling with Linda. She loves 
for birds and mammals and animals and loves the blue footed booby. And before we actually, you know, went on our, on our cruise, she kept saying, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to snor snorkel. I don't know if I can snorkel, but she got her snorkel ahead of time and she went to her pool and I could hardly get her out of the water. I was freezing and because we had to swim with buddies. So she kept me in the water. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your time. I'm sorry we went long. We're gonna stop sharing now and uh, Julie. Awesome, well, thank you so much, uh, Linda and Judy. That was fantastic. Um, a lot of cool pictures there. Um, and we do have a few questions here. So I also wanna invite anybody else who has questions who hasn't yet put them in the Q&A um, uh, section to put those there. Um, our first question here is um, the following. The soil in Rubidia is so red. What causes that red color? Okay, it's iron oxide. So any of any stone of any type, it, it really has to go back to the minerals in terms of, you know, the color is, is what gives it the color. So it's iron oxide. I was gonna, I was um, gonna which island? <laughs> go ahead. Which island uh, you visited was your favorite? Uh, so much incredible nature. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, so we've got about three questions here. Which island is your favorite? What's the name of the touring company that you used? And are there any companies that you would suggest? National Geographic. Um, I've always looked and I saw, oh my gosh, that's just so expensive. But you get such super treatment. You get such um, knowledge and excitement and enthusiasm. And I mean, they did things like help us take better photos and all kinds of things. Um, I would say I, I will pay the bucks and go. Um, my favorite island, um, I have to say the booby, blue footed booby <laughs> island, but just looking out, all that blue. Yeah, it's too much. It's awesome. I don't know. I would agree that North Seymour, where the blue-footed boobies were, um, we just felt so much at one with nature. Um, the other one was Fernandina with all the new lava. And, you know, I just like looking at um, the changes in, in landscape like that. Absolutely. Um, can you say and spell the names of the two types of lava? Yes. Ah, uh ah. -uh is A-A, -A. and Bahoy Hoy is um, P-A-H-O-E-H-O-E. -E. Oh, thank you. And um, we have a few comments in the chat. Uh, multiple people saying fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Someone was actually there in October. Um, and someone else was there in the early 70s. So um, a lot of people loving the Galapagos. Uh, our last question here, unless anybody else asks any more, uh, is which island has the largest turtles? The lar largest turtles? So there's sea turtles and giant tortoises. The sea turtles are um, in the ocean and um, we the ones we saw all appeared to be the same size, no matter which island we were in, around. Um, in terms of giant tortoises, um, the one that we showed you was by Alcido Volcano on Isabella. There's uh, ten species of giant tortoises there. Um, they were the largest that we saw, and the Alcido Volcano has more tortoises than anywhere else. Giant tortoises. So um, I don't know which they were referring to, but so. The one, the big one that you saw moving was probably a hundred pounds or more. And, um, and he was probably, I mean, he was like just super gigantic. Yeah, a hundred pounds, wow. <laughs> um, we've got one last question here. Did you go to the Darwin Research Station? Not on this trip. Um, uh, all places, all cities and ports were closed to vi any visitor, not just our ship, but anyone that was traveling there um, because of COVID. 
we were there in 2004. So we, we have been there and it's interesting because they take eggs from different tor uh, giant tortoises or different, a lot of different species and bring them there. And so we saw tortoises, giant tortoises of all sizes. They had just hatched and then they were huge. We saw Lonesome George there, which was the end of his years, you know, as a 125 year old tortoise. So they had age, all ages there. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to echo everybody else <clears throat> and say fantastic presentation and photos. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and that will conclude our travelogue presentation for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending and for supporting the work of the Geographic Society of Chicago. Uh, please stay tuned on our website and social media for our uh, next travelogue. And um, for more information on how to become a member of the GSC, please visit our website at www.geographicsociety.org. Uh, thank you again so much, Linda and Judy, um, and we hope to see you all again soon.